It's biology with Mr. V. Biology with Mr. V. That's me! Hello, 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 hello. So, this is my YouTube lesson, um, and we're starting a brand new topic. So, let's rock and roll with it. So, this is transport animals now. This is actually the final year 12 topic from my side. How cool is that that we're at that point? That's ace. So, um, yeah, it's a topic where initially there'll be a lot of familiarity because we're talking about just transport systems in general and a little bit of GCC recap. But as we go into this topic, it's going to get more and more detailed and more and more very highly A-level specific. So, very first thing I'd like you to look at is look at the learning points that I'd like us to uh, have a go at today. So in this YouTube lesson, we're going to talk about the need for transport systems, again, linking it back to appreciation of size, metabolic rate and surface to volume ratios of different animals. And we are also going to look at the different types of circulatory systems there are. So single systems, double systems, open and closed systems. My keywords today are double, single and circulation. And the very first task I'd like you to do, really quickly, so I'm talking like a 30 second, one minute job, can you draw, create an alien organism that could happily survive without a transport system? So pause me, draw it, and then play me again to see what you've got. Okie dokie, let's have a little look. You can mark your own. Did your organism have a really large surface element to volume ratio? Because if it did, that's a good start. If you've got a large surface area to volume ratio, you should be able to diffuse so much in, oxygen, glucose, you know, things you need, that you wouldn't need a transport system to spread it around. Did your organism have a low metabolic rate? Was it late? Was it slow? Was it really lethargic? Because if it had a high met metabolic rate, well, that would say it was quite an energetic little alien. Well, then it would be you know quite difficult to get that much, that simply that quantity of oxygen, glucose, mineral ions to the different cells in time. And was your organism Bateson sized, or even smaller, preferably? Was it a steely, tiny, small organism? Because again, the smaller the organism, the less likely it is going to need a transport system to deliver, because. If there's not a very long way for things to be delivered, well, they could probably just diffuse there. Key idea. Have you drawn something where simple diffusion of molecules would be enough to meet that alien's metabolic demands? Because if you have, you've smashed it. Green pens, some amazing things. If you haven't, then think again. Anyway. So it's now really just... Do a little bit to focus on the need for transport systems then. So substances move in and out of cells by diffusion. Movement of molecules in a liquid or gas. Down a concentration gradient from a high concentration to a low concentration. And for a single celled organism, like an amoeba, nutrients and oxygens diffuse directly into the cell from its external environment. And the waste products can just diffuse straight out. That's some very easy excretion. So that works perfectly for amoeba because its surface area is so large compared to its volume. So it can supply more than enough nutrients, oxygen to meet its metabolic demand because it's got such a large surface area to volume ratio. Now the problem we have as humans is that we are made of billions of cells. And substances that we take in have to travel long distances. Even in someone like my size, you know, a molecule of oxygen might have to travel a meter or so down to my feet. We are simply too thick. That's CK, that's not double C. Yep. Uh, we are too thick for simple diffusion to be enough. And again, that, there's some human beings. That That's me. Before I started, whilst no, I think it was before I started teaching. Look how happy and youthful and energetic and optimistic I was about life. Things change. That's that's not Mrs. Bateson. That's my sister, and that's one of my older brothers called Paul. He has a twin brother called Luke, 
who just looks the same but with a beard. Okay. So our surface area falling ratio is too small to allow simple diffusion to be enough. But we've evolved specialized systems to get those nutrients, to get that oxygen into our body. So to get food, for example, we've, you know, we've evolved this fantastic digestive system, the small intestine with its really the big surface area. We, we created that surface area volume ratio with these specialized systems. To get oxygen into a body, go back to the gas exchange system. We've created this alveoli with a massive surface area. We've created it for ourselves. Same for like CO2 being removed. But what we haven't discussed yet is the distance issue. It's all well and good having an amazing uh, specialised exchange surface. If it then has to, so yeah, it's in the body, woohoo. But if you've then got to move it a metre or so, well, diffusion won't be quick enough to meet your metabolic demand. You're a mammal. You are respiring simply to keep warm, let alone to move and, you know, whatever other bits of energy that you need. So, you know, moving things. It isn't just things you take in, it's the, like hormones as well. So you need to move things internally as well as move things that you've just taken in. And the only way we do that is using our circulatory system. Your blood is constantly moving all the way around our body. And our circulatory system, because it's not moving by diffusion, it, it, it's moving because it's being forced to move. So it's an example of a mass transport system. So, if you're a mammal, an effective transport system, a transport system that will deliver, you know, nutrients, oxygen to your cells more than quick enough to meet your metab metabolic demand will include a way of making sure substances are moved in the right direction. So a pump and valves to stop it going backwards. So pump again to create enough pressure to push that fluid around the body quick enough to meet your metabolic demand so the oxygen gets the cells quick enough. A suitable transport medium, that oxygen, those nutrients, they've got to be diffused in something or taken in by something. And also a system of vessels that can carry that substance. So arteries, veins and capillaries are what we have as mammals. And it's incredibly efficient if you can have two circuits, one that only picks up oxygen and another that delivers that oxygen to your respiring tissues. So let's look at these different circulatory systems then. So the spec point, I've got to talk about single circulatory systems, double, open and closed circulatory systems, linking it to mammals, fish and insects. So. That's a fishy, that's a horsey. Horses are mammals, they're not birds. They're not, they're mammals. Fishies and horses, I mean, their circulatory system, it is, it's got more similarities than it does differences, but it's the differences that really are important and really are the bits that we need to really crack. Both have a heart. But notice how in a fish, the blood only flows through the heart once per circuit. It goes into the atrium, ventricle, and then it goes to, this by the way, would be the, the, the gills, the gas exchange surface. Whereas in mammals, the blood flows through the heart twice. So if I take it here, it's just been to all the body cells, it'll go into the atrium, ventricle, go to our lungs, that's a chain system, and then it goes back to the heart to be pumped again to get back to your body cells. So I'm, I'm just going to, again, just clarify what we mean by single and double circulatory systems. And then I'd like you to have a go. There's just a couple of questions, a couple. There's a few little questions to have a look at, probably take you five minutes or so, uh, just to get you thinking about these ideas. So single circulatory system, that bit in red, that's your definition. A system where the blood flows through the heart once per circuit of the body. The root is, you know, goes to the heart, then it goes to the gills, then the body, and then back to the heart. And that's an entire circuit. So here's my questions to get you thinking. Have a go at them. 
pause me so you've got time, enough time to do them it'll probably take you somewhere about five minutes and then when you've had a go put me back on get yourself a green pen and we'll, we'll go through them together we'll mark them okay cracking so pause me do the questions Okie doke. So I've got myself ready. I've got Mrs. Bateson's lovely markable tablet so I can try and answer them as we go. So imagine the blood flowing from an artery into the narrow capillaries of a fish gill. What would happen to the blood pressure as blood is squeezed through the narrow capillaries? Well, here's your interesting thought. You might have instantly thought of when blood is going through an artery, arteries big and wide, and it gets to capillaries, which are little and tiny. Well, obviously, if it's going into a smaller surface, you might have thought, well, that pressure is going to get higher. Unfortunately, that is completely wrong. That one artery will actually branch off into potentially thousands of capillaries. So what you're actually doing, that blood which is under high pressure in the artery, that pressure spreads out, dissipates out, over those hundreds, thousands of capillaries. So actually, the pressure decreases all the way down to next to nothing really next to nothing just want to clarify what clarify why number one if the if the blood is moving slowly that means over a gas exchange surface it's got more time for oxygen and carbon dioxide to diffuse in and out and also the way the capillary is designed they're so thin to allow for maximum diffusion they can't have like a, they can't have like muscular walls or anything otherwise it would take too long to diffuse oxygen and co2 in and out so because they're so thin, they haven't got the protective layer, and if the pressure was high, they would burst, and therefore not function. So the pressure absolutely decreases massively. And for B, that will have the effect of that oxygenated blood going to the fish's body tissues. That means it will travel very slowly to the body tissue because the pressures decrease so much and there's no other stimulus to pump it along, it's going to go really slowly. Really slow speed and really low pressure. For C, so yeah, I mean, if the blood's going really slow to the body tissues, that would suggest a very inefficient system that fish and other single-celled single cell or the single circulatory system organs might have but it's okay if you're a fish a fish's metabolic rate is low enough for this system to still be efficient for them so a single circulatory system would not be efficient in a mammal because I'm having to keep myself warm. I'm warm blooded. So I can be as lazy as I want sat in my chair, but a single single circulatory system would not be efficient for me. But for a fish that doesn't have to control its temperature, yeah, it's absolutely efficient enough. At the end of the day, any system a organism has, has been designed and tested by evolution over you know, millions of years. So it must be good enough for them. And why is it okay if you're a fish? Because they've still got to move like we do. Don't pre presume that fish don't aren't as active as we are. But they are cold-blooded, they're ectothermic, and therefore that means they have a lower metabolic rate than, than us. So they're single. So let's have a look at double. So a double circulatory system, um, again, I've got my definition in red, but just do the blue bit first. So in a double circulatory system, the system's got two separate circuits. One circuit, the pulmonary circuit, 
carries blood to the lungs to pick up oxygen. And the other circuit, the systemic circuit, carries the oxygen and the nutrients around the body to the tissues. So the definition, in a double circulatory system, blood flows through the heart twice for each circuit of the body. And its route is the heart to the lungs, then back to the heart, to the body, and then to the heart again. So we will look in, in very specific detail, actually, you know, at the specifics of the heart and the blood vessels involved. So uh, when we get back to school, yep, yeah, there's another dissection involved. You'll get to do your own heart, well, in pairs or so, your own heart. Um, so look forward to that one. But obviously, over, even if we're over webinars and that, um, if you can't get hands of your own actual heart from a butcher, um, you know, there's YouTube videos and things we can watch instead to help us understand the science. So here's my questions now. So again, take five minutes, pause me, and then get yourself ready with a green pen to go over them. Nice one. So, A. Outline the path that blood takes around a mammal and explain why it's known as a double circulatory system. Uh, I'm not going to write anything remarkable. I'm just going to go back to that slide. You've hopefully given that path. And why is it known as a double circulatory system? You've hopefully just done the bit in red, yeah? Nice one. Why does the blood need to flow through the heart once more after going through the pulmonary circulation? Well, this bit is important. So after going through the pulmonary circulation, going basically through all the capillaries in the lungs, the blood is under very low pressure. So even though it's got all the oxygen those respiring cells need, it would take so long to get to those respiring cells because it's under such low pressure, you wouldn't be able to support your metabolic demands. So it goes back to the heart once more So this heart pumps the oxygenated blood, allowing it to travel to the respiring cells that need the oxygen quick enough to meet your metabolic demands. To basically to do enough respiration to, you know, survive as a human being. Why don't animals simply increase the pressure of blood so that it can flow through the capillaries of the lungs and still have enough pressure to flow quickly around the body? So basically, yeah, well, why, why does it have to? Why, why, why does the pressure have to drop off to nothingness in the capillaries? Why can't we just be like, have a super heart and go, and the blood just goes all the way around straight away? Two reasons. One, time. If it's racing through the capillaries, there won't be enough time to actually diffuse the oxygen in and diffuse the CO2 out. It's got to be by that alveoli for a long enough period of time to basically to ensure maximum exchange. Your second reason is obviously the design of the capillary walls. Because capillary walls are diffusion masters, if I just draw a cross section, The lumen is only one cell wide, that's how small they are, and the wall is similar in size to a squamous epithelial cell. Okay, it's not an epithelium, it's called an endothelium, um, but it's similar in a sort of shape. Uh, it's, it's just absolutely teeny tiny. But again, you've, that, by doing that, that means you've got a short diffusion distance and therefore maximum gas exchange. So if the, it was moving faster, the pressure was higher, obviously that capillary would burst, so you'd need a different wall. And if you had a really big wall to support that pressure, that would mean there is a larger diffusion distance and therefore you wouldn't be able to get the oxygen and carbon dioxide in and out across quick enough. So there's my single and double. So I hope that was useful. I hope that was okay. So let's uh, do the last bit now.
open and closed. Head click. Lots of different animals, generally smaller ones, ones that maybe don't have an issue, a biggest issue with distance to travel, have a type of circulatory system called an open circulatory system. What we mean by an open system is that not all the blood is contained in vessels. So the blood itself bathes the cells of the organisms. So if you look at this little uh, locust diagram here, so yeah, they've got a heart. The heart, by the way, is actually stretching all the way along. If ever you catch a, okay, this is just a little bit of a, something I did in my youth. If ever you get your hands on a, like a daddy long legs, um, or even just a quite a lot, like maybe some large spiders have this. If you look along their back, you can just see like a big black line all the way along their back from like from sort of the tip up here all the way down. That's the heart. All of it is big tubular heart. So the heart is pumping and it pumps the blood in and then straight out into the tissue, into the tissue fluid. So we just have like fluid surrounding our tissue that things can diffuse in and out of from the blood vessels. But... No, the blood literally goes into and surrounds the tissues. So we call this hemolymph. And then eventually you know, it will move its, find its way back to the heart. So, okay, you're certainly de very dependent on diffusion. So being small is helpful because there's not a big diffusion distance. And when the blood actually gets into this hemolymph around the tissues, the only way it moves is um, if usually if the locus moves a muscle and that would like squeeze the blood in another direction. So the only way that it's ever, the blood ever really gets back into the heart um, would be obviously following a pressure gradient, but also if, if blood is squeezed by muscles as it goes in. In large organisms like humans, who where the blood stays in vessels the entire time, um, obviously, we rely on diffusion in and out of those vessels into something called tissue fluid that surrounds our cells. So we have a closed circulatory system. We are not dependent one little bit on diffusing all the way around our body. And we are not dependent on muscles moving. So, if, you know, if, if I'm temporarily, you know, if I go to sleep and I'm not moving, um, my, my, the blood's still going to flow around my body. If a locust goes to sleep and stops moving completely, well, the blood stops flowing. And there'll be a point when it uses all the oxygen and nutrients and it will build up all those waste products uh, with no way of removing them safely. I will stress as well, this heart and the blood, obviously it will also link in with like those tracheoles. So uh, oxygen as well will go into this hemolymph uh, at the same time. So a little question here. Can you suggest why mammals need a closed circulatory system in order to remain active? Why we need the closed? So there's two sort of reasons. In a closed system, you can have much higher pressure. So blood flows more quickly and therefore meets our metabolic demand, more rapid delivery, and more rapid removal. And also because of that idea that transport is independent of body movement. Okay, next. So here's uh, what you can have a go at now. So I emailed, but it is on Filestore as well, um, the Transport Animals booklets. You don't need to have a printer. In fact, even if you did have a printer, I mean, unless your printer can print like fancy booklets so they look really beautiful, you might still just want to wait until we get back to school and you can have your own fancy booklet. All I really ask, guys, is that you write your answer on paper. So, like, put a title, task one, and just, just answer it. Store it carefully, and we can add it to a fresh new shiny booklet when we get back to school. It, it's really not an issue. So, this is task one. Uh, you will recognise some of these questions uh, very, very well. So, ooh, excuse me. So, uh, yeah, give it a go. Um, I'm going to go through it with Remarkable on this video as well, and that will be the almost last thing I do today. So pause me if, if you're gonna have a go at these questions. Uh, I think some of the questions are direct repeats. So if, if, if you think, if, you, if we've already done it completely, there's no point doing it twice, is there, but. Let's have a go through. So we've definitely already done A. Definitely already done A. Uh, uh, the blood pressure, the blood is squeezed through narrow capillaries. Well, you'd think it would get higher going through narrow capillaries, but actually, because there's so many capillaries, it gets a lot lower.
because there's just so many capillaries. So the pressure of the blood going to the body tissues is also much lower. It doesn't recover. The pressure gets really low in the capillaries uh, at the gills and it doesn't get any higher than that. So the speed is also very low, very slow speed. Uh, here's something different though. The steepness of the concentration gradient in the gills and body tissues, well, that is still very, very high. You know, the, the gills with nice low pressure blood flowing very slowly, yeah, though th those red blood cells will be fully saturated with oxygen and all the CO2 would have been removed. So that's, that's really nice, steep concentration gradients going on. So although we have effective pressure, we, there's, no, there's no effect with the efficiency of concentration gradients, which obviously is good and very efficient. So in terms of efficiency with which those metabolites and waste products enter and leave the blood and the gills and body tissues, yeah, it is still very, very efficient because you have still have such a steep concentration gradient. Uh, for question two, two point what I'm just going to call them two A and two B. Um, outline the path. Explain one double circular. Explain why it's known as double circulation system. Yes, we've already done that. Okay, we've already done the path. The why is it a double circulation system? It was that red sentence, wasn't it? Goes through the heart twice for every circuit. So explain how this system would work in terms of blood pressure, rates of blood flow, and steepness of concentration gradient across exchange surfaces. So this is where you now almost try and compare it to a single system. So blood pressure, it's that idea that, okay, it's very high straight out the heart, and then it gets very low in the lungs. But then by sending it back to the heart, you make it very high again, and that delivers it to the body tissues very quickly because it's under high pressure. Obviously, the body tissues got capillaries, so it gets low again. Uh, so it goes back to the heart to get it high and then back to the low. And it's a constant cycle of, oh, no, my pressure is low. Back to the heart we go. Back to the heart. Back to the heart, everyone. Ooh, now I'm fast. Now I'm high pressure, fast speed again. Awesome delivery of blood. In terms of steepness of concentration gradients across exchange surfaces, we are very similar to fish in the way we work like that. Um, in the lungs, 100% okay, of that CO2 should be excreted and the blood will become fully saturated of, with oxygen. In the body tissues, nearly 100% of oxygen will be used. And likewise, all the CO2 from the body tissues should diffuse into the blood. We're very, very efficient. For three, comparing open and closed systems and reference the circulation systems of insects and fish. Um, all we're really looking there is, guys, the idea of open. Um, not all blood is enclosed in vessels. And closed, it would be all the blood is enclosed in vessels. The other sort of comparison is probably the idea of pressure. So closed would have a much higher pressure because it's being forced through a singular tube. Um, closed, the, uh, the idea of diffusion is between tissue fluid and vessels, whereas the only diffusion in the open is directly from that hemolymph from the blood into the cells. There's no like boundary layer. Um, I guess the other thing you could comment on is the idea of whether they are dependent on you moving or not. So closed systems, you don't need to move. Open systems, yeah, it depends on you moving and, and squeezing your muscles against the hemolymph to move that blood along. Okie dokie. Last bit. Now, this is something I am setting, but it does not have to be done now, because even if it is done now, with the amount of marking I have to do <laughs> over the next couple of weeks, you, you got no chance of it getting marked instantly. Um, and it is task two. Task two is a old, not an old, uh, it's only a couple of years old, two, three years old, AS level, AS uh, question. And it was beautiful. It's a beautiful question. I absolutely love it. 
So we can see here, we've got a lovely diagram of a fish single circulatory system and a mammal double circulatory system. And they've given you a diagram of an amphibian system, which is a, it's a little hybrid, isn't it? It's a little hybrid between the two. And they've given you a little zoomed in diagram, zoomed in diagram of the amphibian's heart. So there's a couple of questions at the start, just comparing fish to mammals, uh, as a, one marker doing a statement, but the big one that I'm going to mark is this six marker. Use the information in those diagrams to compare the circulations of the frog, the amphibian, with the mammal. So please don't compare anything to do with fish. If you start writing about fish, that's completely irrelevant. So you have to compare the systems. So literally, say what you see, what are the comparisons? And you have to compare the relative effectiveness. How effective is each type and why? So that's the six marker. I'm setting that for like th three, four weeks time, really. There's no real massive deadline on that one. Um, you'd say you just do not have to do that now. That's what I'm on about. Anywho, that was Biology with Mr. B. Thank you very, very much. Um, See you again soon. Peace out.